From this module, the parts that resonated with me the most was the question of what would theme parks do without oil, reliance on oil, and ancient energy sources. The world without oil video game system is an interesting idea, and the theme parks without oil was mentioned and intrigued me. My family has worked for Disney for over 30 years, and we are very big Disney fans to this day. As mentioned in the lecture, eventually scientists and industry experts would be able to adjust oil industry infrastructure to adjust to new energy sources, such as crops, solar, wind, and water. But until that switch could happen, how would Disney be affected? Some ideas that come to mind are the ticketing reservation system currently in place. Would that need to revert back to paper tickets like in the 80s? Of course, ink requires oil for those tickets, but they would have to be handwritten and bought day of instead of pre-planned and pre-sold. Disney hires many international employees. Would these employees need to be hired locally instead from the Orlando area and within a certain mile radius of the park? The possibilities are endless of what would need to change and relies on innovation. As mentioned in the video about Worlds of Oil, this is public media at its most innovative, engaging a global public concern with the world's dependence on oil and both educating them and moving them into action. In the lecture, it was mentioned the ancient energy source technology, and this made me think of Yazad, or the city of wind catchers located in Iran. This is Thank you very much indeed, John, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure to be able to talk to you about one of my passions, which is the wind catchers of Yazd. A wind catcher in Persian is called a bardir, bard, wind, gear, to take or to catch. And in a building, you can catch wind in so many ways. And here we see, you can put a barlach on there. You can catch it on the roof. You can stick a window out, as in Mecca, with a, a mashabiya. You can open a door to the beach, as you do in Kuwait in the old buildings. Or you can raise the flaps of a tent to catch it in passing. It's so sensible an idea that, of course, wind has always been used. Um, since the beginning of records of buildings, and here we can see a wind catcher on the pharaonic house of Neb Amun um, from 30, around 1300 BC, where these wind catchers on the roof probably doubled as stairs onto it as well. He uses natural elements to have air conditioning and was invented in ancient Egypt in 3100 BC. Wind catchers don't need electricity to function and they vary in look and size. They can have several openings or one depending on wind direction. The wind moves into vertical sections that slow the wind down and direct it into the building and out the bottom. Some buildings are even built with Mediterranean pools at the bottom that help cool the water and cycle it back up through the house. The third part of this lecture that resonated with me was the talk of reliance on oil. The world economy depends on fossil fuels for almost all of its energy, 30% of that coming from oil. In the End of Oil Explained video produced by Vox, they say it's a tremendous irony that the very substance that helped us achieve this level of development today are now the very substances that endanger the future civilization as we know it. Oil production has led to inequality and injustice. An example of this is the country Nigeria. Nigeria was originally an agricultural based country and their people would leave fish nets in the water and come back the next morning and they would be able to just rely on the water and the land for their needs. But BP was made aware that Nigeria basically was a giant oil pit and they took advantage of that. 
going to the UK to get permission to mine there, terming the area black gold. This is just one example of how oil has changed the stories of many peoples, cultures, and nations.